right, so I hope you can hear me well. Um, yeah, after all these, or not after, in between all these great Web UX talks, I want to take a little more metaphysical route, talk about some soft skill stuff. And uh, today I want to explore with you the question, how to become a team that learns? And uh, what does it matter? Why should you even care? So most of us here are involved in building software in some way. We're developers, we're designers, we're product managers. And most of the time, of course, sometimes we're just building another homepage, but most of the time, every project we do, every product we build is something that hasn't been done this way before. <clears throat> so there's no one we can ask how it, should, uh, how it should be done. We have to figure it out ourselves. Then a lot of times the requirements of what we're building is unclear. We have a rough idea of what the product should look like, but exactly who is going to use it and how they're going to use it, that's oftentimes not clear and that's something that's perfectly normal in agile software development, but still it's something we have to figure out as we go and incrementally become more aware of what we're actually building. Then of course there's new technologies all the time, there's a new JavaScript framework every week, there's new editors, tools, libraries we should take a look at and figure out if they make our product better and um, yeah, if they make it more productive, if they increase our product, make it more stable, perform, whatever. And um, so with these things in mind, it's, I think it's very essential that we need to learn all the time. So not just, um, and learning it's not just a verb, it's a noun. So it's a, it's a process, it's something that has to happen all the time. It's not that at some point we say, okay, now we're done learning, now we can just execute and deliver stuff. So um, because we're figuring out stuff all the way, Software development is still a pretty young discipline, so we have to figure, stuff as, figure out stuff as we go and take every opportunity we can get to learn and grow as a team and improve ourselves. And there's some, there's some environments, some team environments, some work environments where this works better than others. And to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, so we all know the situation where um, we're starting a new job, we're part of a new team, we're meeting new people, and yeah, you probably don't want to seem ignorant or incompetent or negative. So you're a little, yeah, not too self-conscious in the situation, just trying to get to know the people, don't want to make a bad impression. And that's actually pretty easy to achieve. So if you don't ask any questions, you won't seem ignorant. Great, it's simple. People won't think, okay, probably stupid or smart, I don't know, but at least not ignorant because it's not... Um, you're not asking stupid questions. Or just don't admit any mistakes, then you won't seem incompetent. Maybe we'll catch up with you later, but for now, you won't seem incompetent because people think, okay, you're not making mistakes, so you're probably not incompetent. If you don't want to seem negative, just don't criticize anything. Don't, don't give any feedback, just accept things the way they are, and yeah, people will think, okay, pretty, pretty relaxed, um, but not a negative person. Great. And this is so-called impression management. So you're actively thinking about how you, what kind of impression you want to give to other people and trying to make sure you're not giving a bad impression and um, yeah, just, just being very conscious about it. And that's the kind of environment that's not good for learning because you, you're very consciously thinking about what kind of impression you're giving to other people. You're not asking any questions. You're not trying to figure stuff out. You're not giving feedback. You're just accepting things the way they are to not make a bad impression. And this is the kind of environment that's not good for learning. And so on the other hand, the other kind of environment is one where you feel safe to do these things, where you think it's okay to ask questions, even silly questions. You feel, okay, I should know better, I should understand this, but I'm not sure, so I'd rather ask than, than be ignorant about it. And this kind of environment where this works well, where, where I feel it's okay to ask questions and to give feedback and to, to dig deeper and try to understand things. Um, this is called, the psychological term is psychological safety. And it's well established in other areas, but um, it's very important for learning. And yeah, since it's so well established, there's a nice definition for it. It's psychological safety is a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns or mistakes. So this is very important. It's uh, the feeling you have when, you, when you're in a comfortable situation with people you know very, very well, where you know it's okay to ask a question, to, to give someone some feedback, criticize something, just figuring out stuff together. If you feel comfortable about, about that, if you feel safe in that situation, then that's a high degree of psychological safety. And clearly asking questions and stuff like that is very important for learning and growing as a team.
And so this is exactly the idea behind it. Um, of course, learning is very valuable in and of itself. We have to do that all the time because software development, we're just figuring it out. It's pre still pretty young. And um, the idea is psychological safety provides the kind of environment where it's possible to learn from your experiences, to grow as a team, to improve yourself. And clearly this learning, understanding things, asking questions, figuring stuff out, clearly this will lead to better results. And that's why I think it's also so important in a business context, because of course learning is great and a great value of itself, but in the end, of course, we have to deliver something. We have to release a new app and build a new feature, that kind of stuff. And so this is how you get from psychological safety, provides environment for learning, and the more you learn, the more you understand, the better results you will deliver. And to show that this is not just an abstract idea, there is um, Google did some extensive studies about 10 years ago, um, did some extensive studies and trying to figure out what was the main difference between teams that consistently delivered good results and teams that did not. And as you can see, there's a number of factors in play, but what Google found very consistently among the top performing teams is the one thing they all had in common is they all had a very high degree of psychological safety. And this was the one important thing that made the difference between high performing teams and teams that did not perform so well. And um, clearly, Google is doing pretty good. So um, if, they th if they say this is very important for teams, then there's probably some value to it. OK, so this is the idea why psychological safety is important. It provides an environment to learn. And the more you learn, especially in software development, in such a creative and still young and still figuring out discipline, the better the results will be. So the question is, um, how can you achieve this? Is this something that just naturally happens or does not happen? Or can you actively work towards this? Can you actively consciously, de deliberately try to create this kind of atmosphere and this kind of safety? And the good news is you can. The sort of bad news is it's really, it takes work and it takes time and you really have to actively work on this to achieve this. And so the basic idea is you start out with positive experiences, more on that later, and these positive experiences will lead to a feeling of trust between team members. And if this trust really establishes and settles <coughs> and turns into a value that the whole team shares and understands the importance of it, then this is psychological safety. So that's the difference. Trust is just on a personal level. You trust someone and they trust you. And if this trust is a team value, a value that you and the team share and everyone believes it's important, then this is what you call psychological safety. And so if you follow these next four simple rules, then we will just work. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do, but I picked out a few examples for it. And um, yeah, again, the most important thing is just being curious, trying to understand stuff, ask questions. And even if you think it's a stupid question, you should know better if you're not sure rather ask it and um, then you will understand something else probably as well. So be curious about things, ask questions, also acknowledge that you don't know everything and you don't have to know everything, that's fine. Um, someone else can help you out with it and probably you can help someone else out with it, so that's good. Be supportive, try to share your experiences, your knowledge, your insights with your colleagues. Try to be available and welcoming. If they come to you with a question, that's the other way. If they come to you with a question, take your time to give them a good response and try to understand it, make sure they understand it well. And um, share your insights and learn from each other. And this is more of a team lead thing, but as much as possible, try to make decisions together as a team. Discuss, um, discuss what you have to decide on, try to find a good decision together as a team. Um, it has two good effects. On the one hand, um, everyone will feel involved and we feel they can make an impact and, and really change the decision or alter the decision. And of course, on the other hand, the more people that are involved in making the decision, the better it will be because you have more different points of view, more different experiences, and you will get a more informed decision. And everyone will feel involved and will feel that they can make an impact. And as far as that's not possible, making a decision together because it's already been made, it's coming from the higher-ups or something, 
try to explain the decision well, make sure everyone understands why the decision was made this and that way. Because there's some business context going on, you have some, some resource constraints, you have to release it before this deadline because there's this and that important event. So just make sure everyone understands why the decision was made this way, um, because clearly you can only support a decision that you know why it was made this and that way, otherwise it will be very abstract to you. And finally, bond with your fellow humans. So of course, learning is not just about becoming a better developer or designer or building a better product. It's just as much about growing as a person. And uh, what better way to grow as a person than to learn from other persons. So try to connect on a personal level, do fun stuff after work, whatever, have a beer, do some other fun stuff, um, find other topics to talk about and passion that you share besides work and connect on a personal level so you can also grow as a person and also on that level learn from each other. And also it's just more fun. But there's one danger with psychological safety, a um, certain trap you can fall into, because when everyone is involved in yeah, trying out stuff and asking questions and really understanding things, you will probably not, not get much done because you're all the way um, yeah, trying to learn and understand things. And um, you must not forget about accountability, so feeling that you're responsible for actually delivering something. You have to release at some point and build a new app and get it out there. Otherwise, it's, yeah, it doesn't make much sense. Even if you understand it perfectly, at some point you have to release it. So this is um, the meaning of accountability. You feel responsible for actually delivering something. And it's very important to get the right balance between psychological safety and accountability right. And to put this another way, if you, if you draw this on a chart, psychological safety and accountability, there's a few different zones you can fall into. So you start out with, um, if you have an environment where there's no psychological safety, but also no motivation accountability, so it's not a great environment for learning things and understanding things and growing, but also you don't have any stress, you don't have to release anything, so that's just apathy zone. Yeah. Well, you're not learning anything, you're also not doing anything, so completely boring and useless. Um, on the one hand, if, if one of these factors is high, but the other one is not, also not great if there's a good amount of psychological safety, but um, you have no, no, nothing you're working towards, no release dates, no goals, nothing you have to get done, then this is just comfortable. You feel nice and you can try out stuff, understand everything, but you're never going to get anything done, and it probably also gets boring after a while and you will not learn much because you're just drifting along. The worst is probably the anxiety zone. If you have a low amount degree of psychological safety, but a very stressful environment, you have to you have very strict release deadlines, very tight schedules, that kind of stuff. But it's not a great environment to learn from it. This is the anxiety zone is very stressful and clearly not healthy over a while. And um, the one that's missing is, of course, the sweet spot. That's where you want to land. Um, you have a high degree of psychological safety, but you also have a high motivation, accountability. You know what you're working towards. It's ambitious, but you know you can make it, and you have the environment where you still, while working towards whatever goal, you have an environment where you can still learn from it along the way. So this is where you want to end up, and I also think, uh, think it makes sense intuitively. You best learn if you know what you're working towards. You have some constraints, some time constraints, but you can figure out stuff along the way because there's still enough space for it in the right environment. That's where you really learn and grow. <coughs> and again, there are some things you can actively do to achieve the right balance between psychological safety and accountability. So on the one hand, there's, you have to have a very compelling goal and a very clearly communicated goal. So that means, again, it's, it's about what I said before about decisions. Make sure everyone understands what the goal is, what you're working towards. Make sure it makes sense to everyone. They understand the context around it, why you need this new feature, what kind of target groups you can reach with this feature, and it will be a huge market if you do this right, or you have to release it before this and that event because, yeah, this is where all the players are, and if you get the feature or the app released in time, um, then you can get huge traction on it. So it should be compelling. Everyone should understand why you're doing this. makes it much easier to work towards that goal. And also make sure it's clearly communicated, everyone knows the constraints, when you have to release what, and that kind of stuff. Then always make sure that everyone can contribute to success, and they feel they can contribute. If they give feedback, 
they can feel it makes an impact, it, it, makes, it, it can change something. Um, so encourage everyone to contribute to, to achieving this goal and giving feedback and working towards it. And of course, experience success. If you actually have a good product launch, release a new app, build a new feature and get it done and it's perfect and everyone loves it, have a beer, celebrate, whatever you like to do to do that. Experience success, let it sink in. It's a good feeling, do it as a team. And um, yeah, just let it sink in and have that good feeling. On the other hand, failure. Um, something not uncommon in software development. Again, this is perfectly fine. It happens, we're just figuring out stuff as we go. So failure is fine, but there's a right way of failing. And um, something that's very common, that's also one of the reasons why there's agile software development, it's fail early, fail often. Don't just build something in your basement for a year and then release it and see, okay, uh, no one's using Internet Explorer anymore, but the feature is in Explorer only. Whatever, don't just work on it quietly. Try to get it out into the open as soon as possible. Do alphas and betas and get customer feedback as early as possible or as early as it makes sense and learn from this and adjust accordingly. If you're on the right way, that's great. If you're going the wrong way and you, you find out after a month, then you probably still have a lot of time to adjust and figure out what you should actually be doing. So fail early, fail often, and adjust. And also very important, fail in a controlled way. So it's fine to fail, but make sure you know the worst case scenario. You, have, you put some thought into what could go wrong and how can you recover from it. And so if you really fail, then you know, okay, well, it doesn't work out this way, but this is how we can go back into a way um, uh, where we have everything under control again and where we can adjust. So really put some thought into, if you, especially if you're doing some uh, prototypical stuff, doing some experience, put some thought into how, if everything goes wrong, how you can recover from it, then you have a chance to learn from it. And this, of course, the most important of these points, failure is a great way to learn, um, even, probably even better than success, but of course also good to learn, but failure is yeah, a lot harder. Um, and really, if you fail, that's fine. And if you do it right, that's even better. And if you fail, if something goes wrong, take your time to learn from it. Sit down and analyze what went wrong, were the assumptions wrong, did you lack some technical skills, didn't you have the right resources, whatever. Sit down, do a post-mortem analysis, retrospective, really figure out what went wrong, learn from it, understand it, and do it better next time, because failure is fine, but failing the same way twice, well, that's not good. So really take your time and learn from it. Good. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about psychological safety so far. And now the good news is a lot of this is already pretty firmly established in the Scrum development process. Um, so who's doing Scrum? Okay, so it should be rather familiar. And I guess all who are not doing it have probably heard of it. So I'm not going to go too deep into this. So the good news is a lot of this is established in Scrum, and Scrum is very good at establishing psychological safety. So I'm going to take a quick look at some of the points, how this fits in. So one important part of Scrum is planning poker. Planning poker is where everyone, the whole development team, sits down and discusses what needs to be done in the next sprint and everyone has to individually give an estimation of how complex they believe a story is. And in order to do that, you really have to understand it. You have to understand what you're actually building, what kind of bug you have to fix, or what kind of feature you have to build. So you have to understand it to give an estimation, and to understand it, you really have to, of course, you have to ask questions and discuss it with your colleagues. If everyone got it right, what kind of ideas you have about implementation, maybe there's a real library for it. Really go back and forth, ask questions, really make sure you understand it, um, discuss it with your colleagues, and then you can give an estimation. So planning poker is very good for getting a good understanding and you're really forced to ask questions because otherwise you're going to make an estimation that you can probably not argue for. Um, so make sure you understand it. Then code reviews and extreme programming also very popular in Scrum. Um, so you just sit down on one machine and develop together side by side or you review each other's code, give feedback to it, also very good, you're working very closely together, you can give feedback very rapidly, you can exchange ideas very rapidly, and of course this is very good at building trust, working closely together, giving feedback, learning from each other, 
and um, yeah, very good at building trust. And finally, this is probably the most important part um, of Scrum in terms of building psychological safety, is the retrospective. That's where the development team or the Scrum team, and really only the Scrum team, there are no outsiders there, it's only the team, sit together um, for each iteration and discuss what went wrong and what went right. Not really about technical stuff, not um, about which library you should have used or which framework, but really just about how was planning, were estimations good, why were estimations good or why were they bad, did we have the right time frame, did we really understand what we were trying to achieve, what was the sprint goal, really discuss all that meta stuff in the retrospective. Um, and it's very important to make sure this is a safe place, though really only the Scrum team is present there, and everything that's discussed in the retrospective stays in there, it doesn't leave the room. And this is very good, of course, um, the, if, if you know it doesn't leave the room, it doesn't leave the team, then of course you can criticize and give feedback much more openly. So this is really great at establishing this kind of psychological safety and this trust on a team level. Um, yeah, I think that's it so far. And uh, one more thing from our side. Um, so we're actually trying to, to live by this, more or less, um, as much as possible. And if that sounds like the kind of uh, place where you also want to work, there's actually opportunity now. We're looking for a UX UI lead. Um, doesn't matter if you're very experienced or just getting started. Um, as long as you have some cool ideas and uh, do this passionately, talk to me afterwards and we figure something out. And we're actually based in Salzburg, so that's probably also good to know. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.